everybody. This is Elon from Insight Fighting, and this episode is on what many people consider to be the first American mixed martial art. I actually have some experience with it. I had some very, very odd classes I took, and my voice has once again gone into this weird place. Anyway, stay tuned. Stay tuned for this episode. It's on Kajikembo. Let's just jump in. It's actually going to be a really, really interesting episode. I have a lot that I want to say about Kajukembo. I think it's I'm just going to give it away. I'm going to give it away before I do my weird theme song. It's an amazing martial art. It's confused, but it's amazing. Pow, pow. Inside, inside fighting. Yeah. Dangerous, dangerous martial arts. Pow, pow. Ooh, ah. Okay, so that was a lot. Uh, let me first talk about my experience with Kaju Kembo, and then I'm going to show some video. You know what? Taking that back. I'm going to show first some demos of actual Kaju Kembo. This is what you see when you search Kaju Kembo online. You see kind of these quick motions, pow, pow. This reminds me so much of Kembo, these demos. Although a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more forward pressure, and a little bit more influenced by Filipino martial arts, if that makes sense. So right away, when you look at these kind of traditional Kaju Kembo demos, which are very pretty, very nice, you're looking at movements that involve closing the gap, quick hand strikes, attacking the throat, attacking the groin, no wasted movement. In other words, when you move in one direction, there will be a strike. And when you move in the other direction, that strike will be followed by another strike. They are in a constant state of attacking. It is a highly aggressive style. What's fascinating here also, if you look, their movement kind of switches in between what you would consider a combat sports style, boxing, kickboxing, influence style into this kind of panantukan, uh, kempo, quick hand movement system. Uh, I'm going to jump into the next demo here because I actually really like this next guy's movement a lot. And I, he's also in this video highlighted randomly. But, uh, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I don't believe this is actually what Kaju Kembo is. So as odd as that sounds, I think this is a, a part of Kaju Kembo, but I think Kaju Kembo is much deeper than this and oddly much more crazy than this. He, he moves really nice, actually. He's constantly protecting his head. He's doing nice checks on the outside. He's closing the gap all the time. He's going for sweeps. So if you look, there's a lot of amazing principles they're picking up here. Now, I'm going to talk about this as I put this next demo on. Beautiful check right there into elbows. I know people are going to watch this and go, these are these are choreographed uh, attacks. These are, these are attacks that wouldn't work in the street because they're not actually training them against a resisting opponent. This is a demo. This is a drill. Not every demo and drill is intended to represent the entire system that you train in. You train in these demos and drills for other reasons. Sometimes they're for coordination. Sometimes they're to develop a certain skill set, like constantly moving forward, not having to think about your next attack, uh, you know, developing uh, hand motions that are attacking sensitive parts of the body, such as the groin and throat. These are the purposes of drills, things that you couldn't necessarily do in sparring. And if you look here, there's a lot of healthy principles. He's using headbutts, he's using groin strikes. And he's doing them in a very quick, effective way while also combining some other movements. Now, as much as people will bash this stuff, this is not, again, the true essence of Kaju Kembo. This is a part of Kaju Kembo. So let's just look at the history of Kaju Kembo. Kaju Kembo was developed in the 1940s in Hawaii, and it was developed pretty much to fight off the Navy that was the sailors, the aggressive sailors that were coming in. And it was developed by five martial arts experts at the time who were all young, tough, rowdy dudes who were going out in the street and actually fighting. So their system was born of real fighting. Now, what I will say that I don't like about Kaju Kembo is that I probably believe the Kaju Kembo of the time, which was brutal as hell, I'd imagine, is not necessarily what you see today. But that's normal of any martial art. You often hear my criticism of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is that it has taken a clear turn away from self-defense and become a combat sport. Kaju Kembo has not become a combat sport, but Kaju Kembo has become more relatable to the average person because we're not going to bare knuckle fight and crack our faces, the same kind of thing that happened with Kyoko Shin, where they have to take out face punches, because people don't want to do bare knuckle boxing every day and then go to their job with giant lacerations on their face and black eyes. Uh, and so systems evolve to function in a modern day society. That doesn't necessarily mean the system is useless. Now, what I will say is not as effective in Kaju Kembo is that they're, as I showed previously in these videos, might become, as it goes on and on and on, as, as has clearly happened, a hyper emphasis on these kind of Kempo-ish movements, which don't translate into 
a pressure-based environment because you can't use them in a pressure-based environment. They just don't translate. Typically, fighting is more simple motor function. I talk about this a lot. The, and it's a, it's something that Filipino martial arts falls victim to. When you look at an attack, an attack is a simple motor function. It has to be responded to with a simple motor function. So if someone were to suddenly swing at my head right now, as much as I know silat, as much as I know panantukan, as much as I know complex motor function responses in a controlled environment where I might parry the hand, hit up, break the elbow, backhand the face, elbow, you know, elbow up, all these things, that's not going to happen the way I train it. What's going to happen the way I, in a real life situation, when someone just swings at me, which is just a violent, basic, one motion attack, when that happens to me, I am going under a, a, an environment of stress, an environment of panic to respond to that with a basic motor function. Whether I want to or not, that is all that will happen. Meaning, I'll see it, I'll freak out, my brain will go into survival mode, and I'll probably have some kind of instinctive response that hopefully works and protects my head, like hugging my head, like throwing my hands up, like maybe just covering up like this. Whatever that response is, it's basic. It is instinctive. And your training should reflect that. Your training should develop a healthier instinctive response. Meaning, if I get someone in my class when I'm teaching them on the first day, and I do this to all my students, I have them line up, if they're a new student, I go, it's nice to meet you. And then I fake swing at them. Why? Because I'm trying to see whatever that natural response is from day one. Some people shrug. Some people lean back. Some people put their hand forward. But what you want to do is look at that immediate response that they had. In other words, if they shrug, I don't want them to lose the shrug. This is actually a healthy response. I want them to learn to shrug and lift their hands. That's all I'm start. I start developing that kind of instinctive thing. If they lean back, I want to start teaching them to kind of get a base as they move back. So in other words, their legs will become more squared off so that they're not off balance. And again, if they lean back like this, lift your hands from here. Oh, look at their body. Their hands went like this. Now I just have to teach them, lift your arms when that happens. And I'll constantly be sucker, fake sucker punching my students to see if they develop healthier instinctive responses. But what I'm not doing is teaching them complex motor function as a response to basic attacks that are going to catch you off guard in the street, because that's what real self-defense is. I want a basic response. Now, there's a difference. What I'm saying is when that happens, you are reactive. When you are reactive, you are not able to do something complex. But that doesn't mean that after I learn my basic kind of response here, when I get control of you and we're in the clinch and I'm overhooking you and I'm doing all this stuff, that now I can't start looking at other options that are more complex. In other words, I go from a reactive state to an active state. And what I hope I do to my attacker is take him from an active state to a reactive state. That is what fighting is for me on some basic level. When I talk about the scale changing, what I'm trying to do is take him from an active mindset. He knows he's going to attack me. He knows he's going to sucker punch me. He knows he's going to rob me. And I want to put him in a state of panic over here where he goes, oh my God, I don't know what's going to happen next. What is this guy going to do to me? How much is he going to hurt me? Where's the next attack going to come from? Is he going to rip my throat out? And I want to change that mindset so that they're the victim, so that they have to worry about what I'm going to do to them. And now I get to control what I do. And that's where complex motor functions come in. So my experience in Kaju Kembo, let me just put something on in the background just so we're watching it while I rant about this because I'm going on a rant. My experience with Kaju Kembo was I went into this Kaju Kembo class and I was an okay martial artist at the time. I was younger than I am now. And it was really fascinating because all these demos that you see here, I remember the first thing that the teacher told me is he said, this guy's just going to punch you. I'm not going to tell you from where. And this is literally what he did with beginners. And he goes, I just want you to hit him 10 times. I don't care how you hit him. I just want you to keep attacking him 10 times. That's the drill. And so the guy would throw like a hook, I'd cover up. And he didn't even care about how you covered up as long as something blocked that thing from hitting you. And they would try and hit you. These classes were brutal. And then you had to hit 10 times. And what he said he was trying to develop and what Kaju Kembo really focused on was hyper aggressiveness, was that when the fight starts, it does not end until the other person is finished. And you do not think about when they are finished. You focus on overkill. In other words, you do not react to your strike. They have to react to your strike. You continue striking. It's not your job to figure out when the fight's done. It's your job to put them into the ground. And that was very much the Kaju Kembo mentality. And it, it continued on even into every aspect of their training. 
despite all these complex motor functions, which are pretty, when we sparred, they sparred hard. They didn't care about how it looked. They didn't care about what was going on. They would put on gloves. And the most fascinating thing about it is every student sparred differently. They kind of developed their own responses over time. These kind of some looked a lot kind of more bladed. And I'm going to show that in the sparring here. Let me actually pull this up because I think this is super fascinating. Even in, in the sparring footage I found, that concept was reflected. Because here you see these guys sparring right here. They're doing their own rule set of kind of what I would consider Kyoku Shin rule set, bare knuckle, no protection, but they're also allowing takedowns. So, you know, you would see this in a Nashihara kind of, uh, but they continue on the ground. So you would see this in a uh, Gonkwal Yusul. I did a video on them, but it, it looks like bare knuckle fighting to the body with full ground fighting. I think this is an excellent, excellent way to train, by the way. It develops a lot of toughness. You're not taking brain trauma. Your body's getting tougher. You're still learning ground fighting. And if there's an emphasis to get back up here, like those elbows were very nice. Uh, but that was a nice, he survived it. But this is a nice exchange, especially to learn how to get tougher, to learn how to deal with all ranges, and to not risk severe brain injury. Uh, and this looks like an MMA match with bare knuckle fighting to the body. Uh, I love this rule set. This is my favorite means of fighting a lot of the time, unless I'm putting on gloves and doing what I would consider a more Muay Thai style fight. The problem when I do that is I'm learning some bad habits with the gloves on because when I fight in Muay Thai versus empty hand, I get very used to just being here. This is this is my my gloved position. I get very used to kind of like a peekaboo or standard Thai approach where everything is just kind of tight and I don't have to worry and I move my head a little bit, I close the gap. But when I go empty hand, it doesn't translate well. An additional problem with when I put on the gloves is that I cannot do 90% of what I do on the ground because I cannot grip. So right off the bat, I do think there is value in this kind of fighting. Now, if you look, though, it's so different than this other school right here where they're fighting more bladed. They're still doing contact. They're still gripping each other. They have MMA gloves on. They're doing quicker hand motions. So the style changes drastically from Kaju Kembo school to Kaju Kembo school. But most importantly, it changes between student to student. In my experience with Kaju Kembo, people are allowed to develop as they please. And I think that's a very important way to train. I think some people's bodies naturally fight better bladed. Some people's body mechanics naturally fight better squared off. Some people like to get in close. Some people like to fight far away. I think sometimes traditional martial arts suffer from a consequence, as a consequence of their tradition, as a consequence of the fact that they keep everything so hierarchical and that you have to follow these exact, exact techniques. In other words, if I go to training and I kick you a certain way, even if that, and it lands and it hurts you, even if that kick is not part of your system, even if that kick is not done right according to your system, I should not be in a position to take it out or to be criticized for it. It worked. If it works, use it. And Kaju Kembo takes that approach. It's got a little bit of this Jet Li, uh, Jet Li, Bruce Lee approach in terms of like what you see in JKD, if it works, adopt it, but on a hyper individualized level. And look, in my opinion, these guys are moving okay, but they're sparring with their own kind of rule set that they developed. They're not making hard contact, but they're covering their head nicely. The, the smaller guy, definitely. They're doing kind of what I would consider like a hybrid point yet contact way of fighting. And then if you look at this, because I really went through a lot of striking footage, this almost looks like old school point fighting, but again, with a little bit more contact. Now, if you listen to John Hackleman and some of the old school Kaju guys, and in my experience with Kaju, the way we sparred and the way I heard that they sparred was brutal. It was full contact, bare knuckle, and you actually see that in Fight Quest. And shout out to Fight Quest, because they had an amazing episode back in the day on, on Kaju Kembo. It was absolutely amazing. But uh, he, the guy that was one of the hosts of the show, was severely injured. He got elbowed in the spine because they were doing full contact fighting and they don't follow rules. Now, this is another thing I might say about Kaju Kembo. It felt like early days MMA where there, there was no understanding of head trauma, no understanding of, hey, let's fight safely, let's protect the body. And as much as people say 
these kind of influences here of these techniques because a lot of what they're doing right now looks like again like a panantukan kempoish kind of approach a lot of guys did bring in that flavor into their full context bar because because and i mentioned this gloves were not really a major part of the system we did fight without gloves and when you take the gloves off as much as people say trapping doesn't work comp like you know i just said complex motor functions don't work but let's say once you're in an active position People say you can never pull it off. When you take the gloves off, when you go into a controlled environment where you say, okay, I'm going to cover up and then we're going to get into this clinch. A lot of, once you're in the clinch, a lot of trapping stuff is very, very valuable. A lot of understanding that like my hands can touch your eye now, my hands can touch your throat. Just being aware of that helps in a real life situation. They're doing like drills here of multiple attackers. It might look stupid, but it's definitely at least developing situational awareness. But later on in this show, they just pretty went, much went full contact as like their final fight. And they had to fight in a pit, like fight club style. And uh, if I remember correctly, he knocked a guy out with a head kick, which was awesome. Um, I have one more video here to show of the sparring. And I find this super interesting because they're kind of going very light, obviously, but they're trying at least to implement their emotions. You saw that right there. That looked like that kind of forward step with attacks open hand strikes to the face and to the body. So they're, they're at least trying to incorporate the more traditional or the complex motor functions over their system into the fight. What I will say also about these quick hand slap kind of things, if you get started and you are connecting, it's extremely devastating and hard to defend that stuff. Like the average person is not used to it. And even a lot of trained fighters are not used to it. Anderson Silva trained with my buddy, who does Filipino martial arts Panantukan, and he got really into Panantukan for a while from what I saw with him. They were doing a lot of videos together and Wing Chun. And, you know, that stuff as a supplemental element to your combat sport, to your training, to pressure testing, as a supplemental element outside of that can be fantastic. It can't be the foundation. It can't be the basis, but it can be an added tool. It's the question of how much time do you want to spend doing it? But to say that it's completely useless, so I won't do it at all, can limit you as a fighter. And I, th I think that a lot of fighters nowadays just have closed minds. If it's not a trend, if Joe Rogan hasn't talked about it, if it doesn't, if you haven't seen it in the UFC, it's useless. Much like what they would say about Taekwondo or any other since karate, until some karate fighter comes in or Anthony Pettis comes in and pulls off a slick kick. And all of a sudden, everyone's talking about how cool kicks are. Or Conor McGregor does a shoulder punch, and then for the next six months, shoulder punches are effective. I'm so tired of trends and podcasts determining what's street effective. And the UFC, like as if that's the gold standard. And I get that in, in the comment section all the time. Well, let's see you pull it off in the ring. Come fight me. See if you can pull it off against me, and I'll see if I can pull what I do off against you. I've sparred enough to gain an understanding of my body and know what works for me. And I know that despite the notion that nothing outside of what you've seen in the UFC in the past six months is effective, to you may be reality. It is not reality on the street. There's a lot more going on in the street. There are a lot of variables you can't take into account. And Kajutembo at least tries to address that aspect of things. Is it perfect? Hell no, it's not perfect. It's not the greatest martial art. Would I train it? Yeah, if there was, it, it, the, the thing with Kajutembo, would I train it, depends so much on the school because... Out of any system I have seen, Kaju Kembo seems to be the most varied, depending where you go. Like, I've I've been to Muay Thai schools that are absolutely horrid, and I've been to Muay Thai schools that are devastatingly brutal and amazing. And I would say that the variance there was nuts. But what I will say about the worst and the best is that it was still Muay Thai, if that makes sense. Whether it was bad Muay Thai or good Muay Thai was up to the school, but I knew it was Muay Thai. What I could say about Kaju Kembo is I can't recognize it school to school. It's almost developed in its own pathway in each school. It's the only system that really has that issue that I can think of. So that, that would be a con, perhaps, or, or a pro, depending how you see it. Um, but another con I would say, again, is if you're in a school that hyper-emphasizes on this or hyper-emphasizes on sparring, just very point-based, that could be a negative. I'm not a fan of overly doing the point sparring. I'm not a fan of of hyper fixating on these kind of, you know, the same thing that Filipino martial arts has fallen victim to over the years and Kempo has fallen victim to over the years. But outside of that, if we look at the core system and the root and what it was intended for, it can be a very brutal system. It can be pretty much a system where they're either doing bare knuckle Kyokushin style fights, 
with continued ground fighting. It could be a style where they're putting on gloves and fighting like Muay Thai guys, but with ground fighting, they always seem to allow ground fighting. And uh, so I give it a lot of kudos for what it's trying to be. Uh, I give it a lot of kudos for its history. Do I think it's the first mixed martial art? I don't care, to be honest with you. This is not a relevant thing for me. I don't have an ego about martial arts, so I don't really care which one's the first one. To. Humans have been doing crazy stuff since the beginning of time. We've been fighting each other. Mixed martial arts has been around for eternity, if you actually, not eternity, but since mankind, when we got together tribally and we just beat each other up and fought each other. So there's no first mixed martial art, but Kaju Kembo has a lot of positives. I think it's kind of underrepresented. And uh, so I really hope you like this video. And I know there's going to be some people who tell me it's useless. But again, I experienced it. I experienced that kind of, maybe I just got lucky, that end of it being a very spar heavy, very pressure tested, very figure your own way out, figure your own system within the system out, which is something I haven't experienced elsewhere, truly. And I think there's a lot of value in that. I do think, here's what I will say, because of that end of things, because of how open it was, at least where I trained, it's hard to come in as a beginner and stick with it to become amazing at it. It's almost like a martial art I would have gone to, at least the school where I went to, more advanced, uh, because that would have allowed me to not worry about fundamentals and not be scared to spar with those guys and to develop my own style more. So I hope you like this video. Please like and subscribe. Share it. As always, let me know in the comment section below what you'd like to see next. And I'm going to keep pumping these out, so stay tuned.